A story of passion. You're a feisty little one. Of tenderness. I've never seen such devotion in a droid before. Of courage. That little droid did it! This fall, Lucasfilm Limited takes you beyond the mystery. When I saw him, I said, oh, this guy's perfect. You know, I hope he speaks English. Behind the facade. He and I have been at odds, and uh, there's actually a lawsuit pending, so a lot of this I can't talk about. R2-D2, Beneath the Dome. Emerging from a past shrouded in mystery, R2-D2 burst into the American consciousness with his star-making role in Star Wars, A New Hope. He was actually at the University of Arizona trying to study theater. They had taken a couple classes, but mostly he was working as an ash can. He was doing an amazing production in A Christmas Carol. It was Tiny Tim. And I think he had played in some of the early clubs during the early 60s in England. He trained with the June Taylor dancers years ago, and he was just, you know, he's a hoofer. I'm not real sure that that um, accent is like the real deal. You know, I mean, homeboy is probably like from Detroit or somewhere. I'd heard that he was doing some experimental dance. You know, that was sort of in the 60s. I don't think anybody remembers anything about what happened in those years. When we were starting, he was a sweet young uh, droid and, and very anxious to please. He'd go and get you coffee or something. We actually tried to get uh, him R2-D2 in The Godfather. If I remember correctly, he wanted him for the Michael Corleone role. Since I've read the book, I mean, I could just see him in those scenes when he's walking through the Sicilian countryside with the two bodyguards with their shotguns. And so kind of that image always made me persist in trying to get him the part, but um, they didn't see it. They, uh, Bob Evans called him a runt. Though The Godfather slipped through his grasp, Star Wars made R2 an international star. Still, he yearned for more. I think he really wanted to be in the Indiana Jones series. So as soon as he heard that Stephen and I were doing something, he immediately said, uh, you know, can I have the lead in this? One day in the, uh, in the prop department, he, we found him and he had the hat and the whip. Well, as an actor, you have to understand that R2 is limited. He used to say he would like to have been a Shakespearean actor. He could carry a spear. He heard, I think it's uh, Kenneth Branagh was doing uh, Richard III, and he auditioned for The Hump. And he was very sad not to get it. His glory days behind him, R2 faced an uncertain future. After the completion of Return of the Jedi, all of us went off to other things in our career, and R2 was left in his beach house in Malibu with nothing to do, you know, watch the tide come in and out. It was a dark time for him. A lot of things went on during those lost years. He just kind of uh, did a few independent films, and then he was doing some commercials. I heard that he had, on the side, without telling anybody, had done some dinner theater and some other kinds of things. I mean, R2, at a certain point, uh, he started drinking a lot. I went to see him. He was living in a cabin, just alone. Didn't take care of himself. He was rusty. He had, had let his hair grow. He is somebody that I felt uh, could have benefited very much from Prozac. No event contributed more to R2's downfall than the good fortune of a close friend. I know very well that Rick and R2 were friends at one point. They used to hang out together and party together. But after Rick's Academy Award, R2 didn't talk about him anymore. Well, we haven't spoken in a long time. And I'm not surprised that he was uh, unhappy that I won because uh, he and I have been at odds. You know, he's a keen follower of the Academy Awards. I don't think he's an actor. I think he's a personality. Notice that no one else hires him. Notice that. I don't think George is aware. You know, no, no who's going to walk up to George and say, R2-D2 is a schmuck. Anxious to help R2, George Lucas made a call to an old friend. At one point, George asked me, you know, is there a place for him in Private Ryan? And for a while, I considered making him a beach obstacle. Ironically, it would take the return of the Star Wars series to resurrect R2's career. When we came back to do uh, The Phantom Menace, he was very excited to be a part of it. It wasn't until we actually started shooting that he started to act up. There's been rumor that this, he likes to drink, I think. So sometimes the uh, dialogue comes out, oh, just backwards, you know. The other day he had a line with Obi-Wan, right, and he was meant to say, <coughs> right? Yeah. And instead he said, <coughs> and thought that like none of us would know it. You don't talk droid, do you? He's always on the phone with his agent, like between scenes and stuff, and he's always talking about what he's doing next. When it's his close up, you know, I give him my full performance. And then when it's my close-up, he just reads it from a little page. And it affects my work. 
It's when the girls started coming around. It's these girls, man, in these short dresses and these tight clothes, man. It's like something he hadn't been exposed to. He certainly doesn't have any problem attracting them, so there must be something there. I guess it's just the way he looks. I can't deny that he's a good-looking robot. This fall, there's only one place to experience the genius. R2 is a brilliant actor. His timing is impeccable. He's like a machine. Feel the anguish. When you're at crotch height, it, it's hard to make a good impression. Discover the truth. The success has gone to his dome, I think. In an exclusive multi-part documentary available only at StarWars.com, R2-D2, Beneath the Dome.